morning. My name is Angie Kemper. I am the secretary at the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd in Hazelwood, Missouri. I am here this morning with Maddie Jo and Pez Marie, and we want to welcome you from our home to your home as you join us for family to family worship. Today's service is led by Pastor Linda and families from our congregation. We now invite you into this blessed time with God as we worship together online. We begin today by calling upon the presence of God. We are promised that when two or three are gathered in Christ's name, that God in all of God's power will be with us. And so we begin in the name of God the Creator, Jesus our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to repeat after me in these simple words of confession to God who is reaching out in love to wash us clean, to forgive us, and to fill us with new life and forgiveness. Let us pray the confession. Gracious God, gracious, gracious God, God, we ask that you forgive us. We ask that, that you forgive, forgive us. us. We have messed up. We have we messed up. up. We have fallen into the traps. We have, we have fallen, fallen into, into the, the traps that our world puts around us. That our world puts around us. We have forgotten to love ourselves. We have forgotten to love ourselves. We forget sometimes to love others. We forget sometimes to love others. And we especially forget to love you. And we especially forget to love you. And we have damaged the earth that you gave to us. And we have damaged the earth that you gave us. Forgive us. Forgive us. Wash us clean. Wash us clean. Renew us. Renew us. And fill us with your new life. And fill us with your new life. Amen. Amen. God has given to us the new life of the resurrection. In the power of love of God, we are forgiven all of our sins. And we remember always that we can trust that the presence of Christ goes before us and behind us and around us and within us. Amen. Amen. Our gospel reading for today, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, comes from the seventh chapter of St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. From there, he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre, and went by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. 
They brought him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Hi, I'm Pastor Linda, and coming to you on this beautiful day, it's a day when the heat has finally been become more reasonable and more, uh, more acceptable than it's been for a while. And today we have two stories of Jesus, and, and this first story uh, about the woman who talks with Jesus is just amazing. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your great love for this world. And we thank you for Jesus' reasonableness and for his humanity as well as his divinity. We pray that you will give us a deeper understanding and love for Jesus. Amen. So, have you ever been in a situation where you knew it might not go the way you wanted it to, but you had, um, but you had really thought it through and, and Sometimes you even practice what you're going to say, and, and so you were really trying to be prepared for that situation. And even if you knew that the answer was going to be no, that, you know, no, they're not going to do this, that you were prepared with a nevertheless and your argument. And today, that's what we see. I know I've certainly been in that situation, sometimes with very serious stakes involved. But in this situation, this woman is prepared and she says to Jesus, nevertheless, Jesus, and I was thinking about that. She doesn't exactly use that word, but that's the meaning there. I was thinking about that and, um, and it's like she's saying to Jesus, I hear you. I hear you. She's very, very intently listening. And, and she, has, she has thought this through and thought what might have come up, I believe. And she then says, nevertheless, Jesus, and she makes her argument. And then the story is also in Matthew, and in the two, another time in Matthew, she says to Jesus, I hear you, Jesus, but nevertheless. And she, she um, has this conversation. Um, she disputes what Jesus is saying, but with so much respect that it's really powerful. And so, nevertheless, Jesus is something that I think we can think about after today and think about that as a model of a way to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I hear you, Jesus, but nevertheless. Now, I want to think about a couple of forms of faith together today. We're always talking about them without really lifting them up and thinking about them. Jesus is, is in the area of Israel, and that's the, place, the only place he goes, is in the whole area of Israel. And he mostly uh, goes as south as Jerusalem and then mostly stays up north in the Galilee region. And there are Greek people, Greek-speaking Jews, as well as Gentiles, Greek-speaking Gentiles, all over that area, as King Herod is half Roman, and so he... He has people and cities set up all over the place. And so today what happens in this text is that Jesus is going into Gentile, Greek-speaking territory. I want to tell you a tiny bit about the Gentiles. It's the Roman Empire. So it is the time, um, the time following the great Greek philosophers like Plato and Socrates. And they believe, they believe in a reasoned argument. There is the Greek word logos, and the logos means the word. It means 
it means the word is a very powerful thing. It it's, can be even all powerful. It means um, the logic of thinking and speaking. It means, like for instance, uh, it's L-O-G-O-S, um, and uh, the logos, uh, from that word we get logical, we get logistics, we get words like biological, and sociological, and it is the study of and, and the, the reasoned arguments based on facts about things. And for the Greeks, the logos was the highest thing that there was, this reasoning, philosophical way of thinking and being. And so that is also one way of faith we see in this story. Um, it is an argument with facts, um, and, and, and Mark has Jesus, uh, we see Jesus in this Gentile territory, and we see this story about a, a logical argument of facts, and in Matthew even, Jesus responds to this woman and says, great is your faith. Hmm. And so this argument, this rational argument, leads you to a particular conclusion. And so this woman says to Jesus today, she hears his shocking words, when he actually uses an ethnic slur against her, and we don't want to excuse Jesus from this. He is a human, and he is a man of his time. And he says to her, um, he says to her, why should I take the children, the children of Israel's bread, and give it to the dogs? <laughs> when she's asking for healing for her Gentile daughter. Hmm? Don't, don't, don't tuck this away. Keep it up real, because Jesus really is human as well as divine. And so, so her response is, she right away says to Jesus, and I believe she's well prepared, she says, nevertheless, Jesus, even the children get to eat the, the crumbs that fall from, even the dogs, I'm sorry, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And, and then in Mark, she does, she does another response like that. Nevertheless, Jesus, she says, I hear you, but nevertheless, so the Logos is a way of rational arguing with someone. And that is, in these scriptures, that is one way of faith. A lot of you are not um, into probably um, kind of the spirit-like things or the metaphysical things or, um, or the, uh, the mystical things. The Logos is a way of faith. In fact, John says in his gospel, in the beginning was the Logos the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he's talking about Jesus. So, so that's number one. Number two is, there is also a way of being, uh, a way of faith that is being spiritual and mystical and, and otherworldly and, and liminal, is this beautiful world about the edge of realities, and often we meet Jesus there in our lives when we're just in this in-between space, and we meet Jesus there, and that also is a way of doing faith. Now, if you are willing to live and to walk in both realities, both ways of faith, it's a pretty rich way to live with God. You become wealthy, then, in the ways that you can experience and meet God, if you will experience both the logos, this logical or, or rational way, also the mystical, the, the ways that is in between worlds, where we can touch the heavenly. Now, there's a woman. She presents this argument to Jesus. And the Greeks are there. Now, they're not there with them because Jesus was trying to get away to Gentile land where nobody would recognize him so he could rest because he's so exhausted he can't stand it. And he's trying to hide and she finds him. She knows that he's there and she's ready and she goes and she finds him and she pleads for her daughter who has a demon, probably some serious mental acting out, something like that. And... Um, and John, um, in, in, uh, John, you know, rem we remember John talking about, about this Logos, and she comes and she finds him, and she uses persuasion to influence Jesus. And Jesus finds it very compelling. He wants her to go away. He wants to rest. He's not ready to deal with the Gentiles yet. He's come for the house of Israel, and he wants her to go away. And, um, and he uses this thing he was raised hearing, you know, that the Gentiles are dogs, and pfft, you know, that's the, God is for the house of Israel. But here the Greek people would have been extremely impressed as they heard this story from, 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 the, from the mouth of Mark's words. They would have been impressed that Jesus heard her logical argument, and it's a brilliant argument. 
she steps into exactly she she kind of humbles herself agrees that he is more powerful than she is she she um she puts herself in a sense under the table with the children um seeking for crumbs and she says to him nevertheless even the children drop crumbs and even the children wind up feeding the dogs and and as the greeks heard this brilliant argument and they saw jesus go oh my <laughs> you know and and change change not only his tune about this but his direction and he says you know in in matthew he says great is your faith and in mark he says you know Wom woman <laughs> your daughter's healed and so this whole story is so amazing one of our folks in our bible study named paul said this whole story is amazing to me the greeks could say this man jesus you can present a logical argument with him and he will listen and he will change courses and they would conclude that he is both intelligent and powerful and a presence of power and of god and so Mar in Mark's story, Jesus is speaking to the Gentiles. This isn't so much about an exorcism as it's about. It's about this logical argument and this way of arguing with God. Now, who else did this was Jacob when he wrestles with the angel and he refuses to let go. He says, until you give me a blessing. And we see, we see people in the earliest parts of Gen Genesis arguing with God. So, Jesus is someone who does not have all the answers. That's the first thing. The second thing is this woman changes Jesus' focus. She changes his way of thinking about this and being she pushes a button where he thinks he can limit God's power right now. He wants to keep it manageable, understandably. Have you ever had that? Where you bring things smaller because you just want to man manage them and then God goes poof, poof, and pushes those walls out. You know, my response to that is always, oi. And, but, but, but she does that, and she says, and then he tells her, he doesn't say no really, he just says it's not the time. First, I have to come to the children of Israel. I have to feed the children. Then I can, I can do the other. And she says, no, it is the time, Jesus. And she says to him, you know, Jesus, I've heard about all the feedings of the 5,000. The way God's power works through you, it makes leftovers. And the leftovers are okay with me. I don't want an honored seat at the table. I just want the leftovers. And so she pushes him to understand that there's so much more power than, than he can contain and that it's for the Gentiles now, not, not later in the future. And she also says to him, and the timeline is now. You don't have time to wait to do this. You've got to appeal to the, the power of God and the Gentiles right now. And so this logos faith that she uses, this, this power of the living word, this power this power of reasoning with facts, this logos is the way of faith that she uses to change Jesus. So I just want to say, in case you've never heard this before, that rational, logical ways of thinking about and being with God are also a way of faith. She is also very desperate. And Jesus is going to try to keep this secret. And <laughs> You know, it's beautiful. You go into the second story. And, and the irony of it is he takes in this man who has a speech impediment and a hearing impediment. It might be that he is deaf and so he can't learn to speak in a way that people can understand. But once again, the woman brings her daughter, his friends bring him, and Jesus, um, Jesus just goes the extra mile at least to heal him. And, um, and he doesn't just, like the woman, he says, go on, you know, your daughter's already healed. She's at home, she's well. And the woman readily leaves. But here, Jesus uses everything he's got. It's just a really funny kind of thing. And as Jesus is healing him, he takes and he, he, spits, at, he spits at him and he, he touches him and he, and, and he rubs and he, he, makes, he, he, makes, he says words. And the word ephetha, it means be opened. And Jesus uses everything in his arsenal. And, and he heals this man because he can't just say to him like he could to a Jew, just go show yourself to the priest. You're healed. No, he has to somehow, I think, help this man to know that he's healed. And so when this happens, Jesus, Jesus once again is bringing all the power of the word. He speaks the word, Ephatha, be opened to this healing. 
he needs the Greeks to understand that he is really doing healing here because that is that is who the communities have come together we talked last week about the Gentiles and the Jews are now following Jesus together and, and it's a mess such different ways of being and Jesus here is walking a fine line if he talks too much about about things and about God's power he doesn't want to trigger it triggered the hidden cameras of the Roman Empire, you know, because messiahs get crucified along with their families and their followers. And he doesn't want the Jews to think he's a false messiah because they won't listen to him either. And so he's walking a very fine line here. So how do these two stories speak to our human hearts? And where Jesus last week says where evil originates, no less, but how do these speak to us? First of all, they come to us in those spaces between realities. These people are absolutely desperate. And we learn that desperation is also a form of faith. You know, people used to criticize the foxhole faith. And I used to think, are we standing in a foxhole? I think not. Who are we to judge? But is that desperate faith, that desperate longing, that desperate coming to Jesus? And the desperation of the woman here is a form of faith. And also, Someone said in our Bible study, most of the miracle stories are where someone comes to Jesus to try to get their problem solved, and it, it, it becomes a physical healing. It's a hope coming to Jesus saying, I hope he can fix me. We're looking for deliverance and healing. And there are times that it doesn't turn out right, aren't there? There are many times that our hopes, our prayers, our longings don't turn out right, and disaster happens. People get hurt, people get killed, and we need to always remember that it does not always come out the way we want it to. We are living in the, between the time when Jesus came and when God will reclaim all the earth and make everything all right. And so I want to end with a story today. I want to end with a story about a woman, a woman who um, has spent her life in recovery, her later life in recovery from alcohol. And she was talking about, she said, I've been thinking a lot about desperation and I've been thinking about what I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous in AA. That God's power is there to help you deal with your problem if you're willing to ask for it. If you're willing to turn it over to God. And you have to recognize that that problem exists, that it is your problem and it exists. And there are things that you have no power over, that none of us have any power over. And then you have to take that recognition and turn to God and ask for God's help. Ask for the power that you long for, the power that you need to get beyond this addiction. And there's no way when that happens to credit anyone except God. Because the way it all comes together, the people that God sends to you, the way it comes together with everything you need is a continuing miracle that can only come from God. So I suggest today that we all think about as a model for our faith some of the things we've talked about as different models, but also to think about that prayer, I hear you, Jesus, but nonetheless, I hear you, Jesus, but nonetheless, I hear you, Jesus, but nonetheless, come and save me, save us, save this world. Amen.
Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We invite you now to give an offering to God. Several ways we can give are to offer our time to someone struggling or provide an offering to someone in need, all done for the love of others. If you would like to support our ministry, you can give online through our website. We can and will bring hope to the world. We join together in our offertory prayer. Lord God and giver of all good gifts, we are grateful for all the blessings of life that you give to us. Daily we are fed with good things, nourished by friendship and care, feasted with forgiveness, understanding, and hope. We ask now for your blessing of our offerings and to help and to serve those in need. May they be a great blessing and may the light of Jesus Christ bring hope to the world. Amen. Amen. You are welcome to join us in our closing prayer. We pray together. God, thank you so much for the true light, your Son, Jesus Christ. You have blessed us with your unfailing love and faithfulness, filling us with the true light, forgiving us our sins and dispelling the darkness. Renew our hope and trust in the light of Jesus. Help us to shine the hope of peace joy and forgiveness we lift to you the world and all peoples who have suffered and continue to struggle with covid 19 and this pandemic we pray for slowing down the spread of the virus shield and give strength for all the first responders and medical workers around the world keep them healthy and safe wrap all those who are sick and suffering in your hope strength and healing Remind us every day to be a light to others with the same grace, love, and care you shine on us. In the true light, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now receive the benediction that is thousands of years ago. It means ascending blessing. And that is when Moses' little brother Aaron blesses the people of Israel. And so now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the God of light, Christ who is our light, and the Holy Spirit who fills us with the light of love. Amen.